Good evening. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you tonight to a night in with Frederick Forsyth and Lee Child in partnership with Penguin Live uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of that great book, The Day of the Jackal. I'm Mick Brown and I write for The Telegraph. We're very lucky tonight to be joined by two of the undisputed masters of the thriller genre, both highly esteemed and phenomenally successful. It's probably vulgar to talk about sales figures, but I'll do that anyway. Uh, I, I reckon that between uh, Freddie and Lee, they've sold somewhere north of 180 million books around the world. But the pleasure they brought to those millions of readers is incalculable. But now, without further ado, I'd like to invite Freddie and Lee to join us. We're here to talk about the, the Day of the Jackal, Freddie, which, which obviously is, is, not only is it a fantastic book, it's a fantastic phenomenon. Ah, Lee, there you are. Uh, very, <laughs> very nice. Uh, very, very nice to see you. And thank, thank you so much for joining us here. I was just saying to Freddie that, that we're here to talk about the Day of the Jackal. And I, I'd actually like to, to begin with you, Freddie, if I may. And the first sentence of uh, the Day of the Jackal, it's cold at 6.40 in the morning of a March day in Paris, and it seems even colder when, a man, when a man is about to be executed. Uh, if, you, if you can't read on from then, then you're a dead man. You've already been executed. What, can you take us back to the, to the moment when you wrote that? Where were you? What was in your mind when you were staring at that blank page? I think I, think I probably thought that sentence over a little bit. I mm -hmm. didn't spend a lot of time on celebration for that manuscript, actually. But there are some things that I think are pretty important. And the first few sentences, what I call the grabber, um, and that phrase of mine, which I meant, I think, goes, goes on through the books. You've got to try and grab the guy or lady fast, uh, quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I normally give a book 50 pages, mm -hmm. uh, some, some even less than that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's good if you can to have well, first, I'm intrigued, uh, curious to find out what happens next within the first page. Right. Now, that is uh, obviously the first, the first line. The first five lines are important in that. If you say something like, it's cold at 640 on you know, a March morning in Paris, and it seems even colder when a man right. is about to be executed by firing squad, that says a number of things. What the hell is going on here? Who's being executed? Why? Uh, actually, my find this one indicates not a, not a hit in the underworld. This is official. This is the, the state carrying out a formal execution. Well, that's some crime. You don't normally get executed by fire this one. Just for buying a double yellow. They have had too long. So, hopefully, curiosity. Why is he going to be said? Who is he? And then you go, then you can allow yourself to go back and explain. Well, he was the guy who made the attempt to kill the president of the country uh, on such a date, months before the execution. Right. Then you go on to describe the completion of the execution. He was indeed executed on that day. Jean Baptiste Sebastien Thierry was executed by Francis Watt at Fort Livry on that day. Um, and this is why. And then from that stems the rest of the story. Right. So you have you have to have that arresting a few pages, which are posing a series of questions that the reader assumes you are going you are going to answer. That's the idea. And did you? I mean, having worked as a journalist before, and this was your first book. You'd, you'd obviously worked as yeah. a journalist. Well, you'd written you'd written a non-fiction book uh, about the Afro, but having having worked as a journalist in the writing of that first sentence and the sentences that came after, I know you wrote this book at incredible speed. Was was your journalistic experience? Uh, invaluable in that, in, in because you can't pause when you're a journalist. You've just got to get it down on paper, move on. Yeah, it, it, this is the, the, the strange thing about what happened, that the whole phenomenon, and it was, I think it was a phenomenon, that I wasn't a novelist, uh, either by intent or experience or practice or anything else. I was a journalist. Now, journalists have a number of different disciplines. One is, write your, what your, write your story as fast as you can and get uh, your best shot out fast. In other words, a journalist can't file his copy at uh, 10 p.m. to meet the deadline and then say at 2 a.m. to the editor, I'd like to recall it and rewrite it and mm. do a better version. It's too late. <laughs> yeah. It's so never worked for me, Freddie. It's on its way to the news agent. 
So right. it's the first time right. And therefore, I, what I did was, when you think about it, dash off 350 pages in 35 days, 10 pages a day average. And to this day, it's what you read is exactly what I wrote. Not a phrase, not a word, not a line. It's never been changed. That's extraordinary. It's a weird way of writing. God, you must have felt exhilarated when you when you put the final full stop on and it was it was published without a without without a correction. That must have been well, nice. I, yes, I did I did know what I mean it's been sent back to me said, look, it's not a bad story, not a bad idea, but we really think on a major rewrite here. Um, mm. sudden that change and I would probably go along with it. They didn't mm. say that to me. They took it as was and said, we'll publish it the way it is. Well all right, thank you very much. And that was the way it was done. Never changed. Was that, was that your experience too, Lee? Because you, you you hadn't been a journalist. I mean, you've been working in television, but 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 not not writing in television. I understand. Uh, and there you are. You sit down to write a novel. It's a big decision for you, isn't it? Because one career is closed. And and what made you think you could embark on a second one like this? Well, I think what I had in common with Freddie was that uh, journalism gives you a bone deep uh, understanding that it's you and an audience. Uh -huh. And television was the same thing. It's me and an audience. It's about um, long ago we had gotten over the idea that, oh, goodness, we're going to be communicating with people. You know, that's what we've been doing all our professional lives. So it wasn't really a huge step. It was um, just a modification of the process. But the fundamental proposition was the same. Uh -huh. It was the, the entertainer and the audience. And um, certainly, I know a lot of writers who were journalists because because of that proposition. They they're so familiar with the idea that they have to deliver in a satisfying way, and it wasn't that different for me in uh, coming out of television. Uh, but I remember my first line, and I loved hearing what Freddie said there because that is so fundamental to any suspense writing. Um, my first line was, "I was arrested in Eno's diner." <laughs> and exactly as he said, that poses a number of questions. Well, who? Who are you? Why are you being arrested? Are we yeah. supposed to like you or not? Are you being arrested justifiably or, or wrongly? Um, in one line, you, you, you provide three or four questions and the reader has to carry on. Um, you know, it's not it, the, the old idea of starting with a lot of throat clearing and descriptions of the weather and um, who's wearing what and so on. That never works. And right. it's also interesting to me that 50 years ago, Freddie said he'd give a book for 50 pages. Well, I think that's gone down a page a year, basically, because now people give you about two lines to grab. Right. And right. so you've got to make that first line pay off. Right. And did you did you deliberate over that line? Did it take you a long time before you actually put that line down? Because there you are. You, as I say, you're embarking on a new on a new life, really, on a blank page. Was, were you filled with terror, trepidation, excitement? No, I, I sort of, it was a complex psychological trick I played on myself. I, I just assumed that it would automatically work, like night follows day. I just thought this would obviously work, and I didn't change it. I, and in fact, out of 25 novels, I have never changed an opening. Because mm. I think there's something about the organic uh, impulse. Whatever you put down first is automatically right. And you, it's up to you to maybe change the rest of the book, but not the opening. The opening is usually perfect first time out. Right. You, you've described the uh, Day of the Jackal as the book that broke the mold. What, 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 what do you mean by that, the book that broke the mold? Well, it was a very significant time, you know. Uh, in the introduction that I wrote for the 50th anniversary, I went back to 1967, you know, the four years that preceded uh, Freddie writing The Day of the Jackal. And that was a time of great change. And um, and, and every, everything felt like it could become fresh and new. Mm -hmm. And up to that point, I'd been reading all the usual suspects, Alistair McLean, Neville Shute, ha Hammond Innes, and so on. And, and those guys seemed to belong to the past, to a, a pattern that was um, not tired exactly, but so familiar. Mm. And what we found with the Day of the Jackal was, and I, I, I so remember picking it up, and I have to make a confession actually, that for me it's the 49th anniversary because I was a, 
I was still at school and, and poor. I couldn't afford a hardcover, so I, I would always wait for the paperback. <laughs> and um, it was so clearly going to be different because we, the fundamental proposition of the book, would Charles de Gaulle be assassinated or not, we already knew. We knew the outcome. And so it was going to be something different. And it was. It was, it was about how it was done. It was about the insider secrets. And right. that absolutely delighted me. I just, I thought we are now in a new era. And, right. we, and it proved to be true. You know, books changed after that. It's very interesting, isn't it? Because both of you write very much about processes, uh, insider things that are, that are secret. Uh, and we, the reader, are trusting that you know what you're writing about. Uh, that there's some authenticity in this, you know, that you're not kind of making it up. I mean, would you agree with that? That that that, that, some, that a bedrock, as it were, of of fact is, has been essential to the fiction that you write, Freddie. Is that true for you? Yeah, I think so. I I made a. I didn't realize it. At the time. It was it was uh, something I real. I realized it was pointed out to me later by Harold Harris, the editorial director of Hutchinson's, who said that you've broken every rule of the book, you know. And I said, really, I didn't know what they were. He said, well, that's probably why you broke them. <laughs> But he said, you know, one of the things is that intrigued me, he said, this is him talking first, he's now not dead, God bless him, but he said, uh, it's the amount of research that you brought in, which gives me the impression that this damn near happened. Um, mm. In other words, it might have happened, it could have happened. Feasibly, it's, yeah, it's okay, it's, it's maybe, it did happen. Um, and uh, I noticed that some of these things that are checkable. Uh, and if you want to check them out, now, of course, we're in a different era with the with the, the Google. You can check anything you want. Right. And if you want to check, would this happen? Could this happen? Is this such a place? Uh, then it will confirm to you. Uh, so nowadays, I think I think the thriller writer has to be very careful. He really can't take liberties mm -hmm. with the presumption that his, or his, his reader hasn't been there, doesn't know, uh, is going to be confused by this or overly trusting and mm. skeptical readership and they're going to check things out and they better be damn well accurate. So that was mm. what prompted him about Jackal. He said, it's so accurate. I've looked at a number of things you claim have been absolutely true. Mm. I didn't know that. So you are telling me things I didn't know. Okay. I do. Um, and that's one of the factors of this book that intrigued me that so much of the research is true. That was, a, for me, became a standard and a burden because I then had to continue. Sure. I couldn't just say, oh, you know, uh, uh, there's a thing called the Eiffel Tower in the middle of Berlin. No, there isn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, pre I, I presume you, 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 you'd you driven the route that the jackal drives through France and you'd obviously yeah, it's all, it's familiarize all yourself with Paris and you familiarize yourself with Brussels and all of, all of the, the roads are accurate and and the, the landscape's accurate, and the, even the, the little wayside uh, auberge outside grass uh, is accurate. There is one. It's not called that, but it's, it's similar. Right. And so on and so on and so on. So and the, as, as you say, in a way, you, sorry, I was going to say. You know, they weren't necessary. Right. Uh, I was going to say that, in a way, you may have made a cross and back in, in the sense that having having established this, this, this reputation, this template, as it were, for authenticity and for getting your facts right. Uh, it, it, and also in terms of the process, in terms of the way the police think and, and the way the SIS think. And and for you too, Lee, you you, you know, you, you you deal a lot in those kinds of processes. What's plausible? You know, what 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 a military police do, uh, what what goes on in Afghanistan, so on and so forth. And I guess you both draw on Freddie, you you as a journalist, you 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 obviously rub shoulders with uh, the intelligence services and would it be right to say work for the intelligence services or certainly help the intelligence services at some point? So we said well, we have a nodding relationship. Nodding relationship, okay. But there were some, I'm sure there were some useful telephone numbers. That you could, I ask the questions, they nod. <laughs> right, okay. Um, but you know, the, you know the people to call and you know the questions to ask. And, and, and you too, Lee, do you, do, you, do you have a sort of Rolodex? No one has a Rolodex now. Do you have a Rolodex of contacts in, in intelligence and in, in, in the military who you can call on to, to, to draw information from? Well, I do now, but the problem was that I didn't then when I was starting out because, um, you know, I had no contact with them. So 
they came along later, having read the early books. Um, I've got a, a literal Rolodex. I'm a very old-fashioned person. I still have a file of facts and all that kind of thing. I'm still very dubious about using a cell phone and so on. But I, um, yeah, there's a lot of people write in and say, I, you know, I've enjoyed your books. I, I'm just retired from the FBI. If there's anything you want to know, give me a call. And um, but it's, it came too late, really, for the early books. I, I had to rely on what I could find out myself or what I already knew. And I'm a big believer in trying to make most of it what you already know, because mm -hmm. uh, especially when you're on a, a book a year schedule. It's really too late to do extensive, fresh research every time because you've got a limited number of months. And if you do that research, you've no time to digest it. Research is really like an iceberg. You've got to identify the 10% the at the top and reject the 90% that's underwater and use what's important. And you don't really know that yet. It, mm. it takes a number of years to figure it out. So what I tried to do was, was work on what I already knew with a little bit of judicious making up and some specific research here and there. Mm. You know, how does this gun work? How many bullets are in it and so on? And for my first book, it, it, it was all sort of fed to me because I was writing it just after the, the United States changed the design of its currency for the first time in many, many decades. And there was a lot of journalistic coverage as to why uh, they were redesigning the $100 bill so it would be much harder to forge. And then there was a lot of sidebar coverage about why was that important? Uh, a reserve currency must be trusted and so on. And a lot of detail available. So I was interested in that anyway, and it fed in perfectly to uh, the book that I wrote. Okay. Um, it just really it was what I is what I needed at the time. Right. So have you found that you said you didn't know anybody to call upon when you first started writing, but um, I guess people came to you and 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 started to sort of feed back to you how authentic, how real these books were, and then you were in a position to ask them, well, did I get this right? Did I get that right? I wonder, have either of you, have you ever been in a position where you've 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 written something and one of your contacts, military or intelligence or whatever come back to you and say, well, how, how on earth do you know that? Lee, has that happened to you? It actually did, yeah. It was... Um, it was a shot uh, in the dark. <laughs> I had an idea in one book where uh, I imagined a, a sting operation, a sort of undercover cover operation run by the FBI. And if a, if a normal civilian was to blunder into the middle of it, uh, they would have to be removed and sequestered somewhere for a couple of weeks until the operation was over. So I invented the idea that the FBI bought an old disused motel and put a fence around it and put these involuntary witnesses in there, like involuntary witness protection. And, and I, I, I began to think, really, is, it, is that even remotely plausible? So I did call one of these retired FBI guys, and I said, I've got this idea, this used motel, et cetera, et cetera. And he did say, how did you know that? Brilliant. Yeah, it was a big secret. And, and has it ever happened that, that, that either of you have been uh, talked to, uh, encouraged to write something that perhaps the intelligence services or the police want to get out there? albeit through fiction. Has that, have you ever felt that, 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 that perhaps you're being, because I mean, as a journalist, Freddie, this must have happened to you, that you must have been, as you say, you, you, you rub shoulders with people. And I'm sure that, as we know in journalism, journalists are very often fed information that the authorities of one sort or another want to get out. I don't Does think that I've ever been, been on, no. I don't think I've ever been leaned on to write something. Uh, Never been leaned on. On behalf of, or favorable to, et cetera. But I mean, Lee, Lee's absolutely right in that when you're, small and unknown, uh, they, they, the establishment, I mean, the enforcement of law and order, don't really want to bother with you, because who are you? I mean, it's nice. there are a lot of aspirants mm. who are seeking their, their, their time and their attention, so they tend to mm. rebuff you. At that moment, you can only go to the other part, which is the underworld. So uh. you research in the underworld until you're accepted by the establishment. It's, hey, this guy is yeah, worth collaborating. Then you can go to the forces of law and order. They'll, they'll, they'll fill you in on the bad guys. 
Right. Perfectly but you have to do it. But prior to that, you have to go to the bad guys. Plus, I went in the early stages to professional forces. How do you afford a British passport? Um, and uh, later, during uh, the Dogs of War, I uh, wanted to explore the black market arms trade in Europe. I was advised that it was based in Hamburg, infiltrated Hamburg, got into the inner coterie of a big, the big black market arms dealer there, and um, proposing as a South African, a young tearaway, I suppose, young brutal, young mercenary of the payroll of a South African tycoon who wanted to buy a lot of weaponry to mount a coup in Africa. Now, this went down great. Unfortunately for me, uh, the, uh, the, the, the big you know, master arms dealer, who was a, was a major mega crook, uh, was sitting at his at a, at a, at a traffic light one day in his limo, and it was a, a red. Next to the window of his rear seat was a bookshop. And I didn't know, but the Odessa file had just come out in German. <laughs> one copy had fallen over, and on the back was the face of the guy he thought was in his inner councils to buy weapons on behalf of South Africa. <laughs> so, next thing I know, there's a, my phone's ringing, and it's uh, a, a very clip, pretty short. I say, Freddie, oh boy, I think we should get out of there, not fast. Uh, don't stop for a passport. Uh, just grab, grab a passport and some money and run. So I went down. About 40 minutes later, some very heavy guys turned up at the hotel. I was on a train by then, having jumped literally through an open window, a passing train in uh, Altabahnhof, Altabahnhof, and uh, getting getting out of uh, it, uh, Hamburg in, in a very fast way. I'd never had my, my clothes or my luggage or anything else. I think the tip-off came from our guys. Uh-huh. Penetrated his inner councils looking for stuff he might have been shipping to the IRA. But it was a friendly tip on the flight. I was very grateful for it because it probably saved me a very bad beating, maybe more than that. But it's like a chapter out of one of your books or one of, <laughs> one of Lee's books. I mean, that's an incredible, that's an incredible <laughs> story, isn't it? Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> who'd, 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 who'd ever thought that writing a novel could be so, so perilous? Um, well, well, one, of the, one of the striking things to me about Day of the Jackal, uh, and I don't know whether this. Uh, was, was was completely uh, original, unique, is that the character who is at the center of this book for 340 pages, however many pages it is, we have no idea who he is. You don't tell us anything about his background, about his history. I mean, we can gather his motivation. It's to do with money. That was a big risk to take, isn't it? Big because gamble. the first... Big gamble, yeah. Yeah. What, what... I didn't know till the end whether it would ever pay off. No. But I thought, having kept his anonymity right to page whatever it was, the last one, when he was shot, uh, having attempted to shoot the ball and failed by a, a few, an inch, you know, because he, being British, he didn't realize that when the French had presented a medal, they kiss. And de Gaulle stooped forward to kiss the medal receiver on both cheeks. And he being right. six foot four, the medal receiver being five foot eight. He had to stoop and the bullet flashed past the back of his head. Right. A few seconds later, the jackal was dead. Right. And I thought, do I now name him? Why? So we buried him in a pauper's grave, mm -hmm. still unmasked, still unnamed. And I wrote the, the last line, the day of the jackal was over. Right. And then I thought, let's go back. Went back to the title page and just said, the jackal. And I typed the words the day of in front. <laughs> That's <laughs> never brilliant. Never never That's brilliant. It's, it's interesting. It's fascinating to hear both of you talking about this. Now, uh, uh, Zadie Smith uh, defined a key difference in novelists uh, between what she called the macro managers. And the macro managers are people who lay out the structure of a story in advance, and the micro managers who to put it simply, make it up as they go along. And Lee, I, I, I've, I think I've read that you would sort of probably fall into the definition of a micromanager, that when you when you begin a book, you don't really know how it's going to end, where it's going to go, what, what what's going to happen, which seems to be like diving off a top top diving board into a swimming pool and hoping it's not concrete. 
That's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, in, in my genre, they call it plotters or pantsters. In Pant- other words, pantsters, people who fly by the seat of their pants. Okay. And um, I'm definitely the latter. I have no idea about what the story is going to be or what the book is going to be about or what is going to happen. It just, um, I write, I make it up as I go along. And um, to me, that, for, for me anyway, it, it's essential because if I outlined the whole thing, even in my head, for me, what I love is the story. And I would have already completed that story and I'd be bored with it at that point. I'd mm. be ready for the next story. Mm. And typing it out ready for publication, I think the boredom would show through. So I need to have that spark of invention really for every line. Mm. And um, it is, I mean, it's funny what you say about jumping off a diving board. The metaphor I've always used is being like a movie stuntman who jumps off a 60 story building and hopes that the fire department or the props department has got one of those big airbags in place by the time he gets to the bottom. Right. And, and so far, it's always worked out, but it, it is a bit nerve wracking. What about you, Freddie? Are you, are, you are you a plotter or a pantster? No, I'm the reverse. I, am, I, I need to know my story from start to finish. Who does what, why, um, what motivation, uh, what happens to them. It's a the lot, the detail, every detail. So I'm, in a sense, when I'm writing, I'm just simply putting down on paper what's in the back of my skull anyway. Right. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you have a big chart up on the wall, a sort of whiteboard, as it were, with arrows and connecting this and that? No, no, it's all inside the brain. It's all inside the brain. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Complicated, <laughs> silly mind. Um, I've got a lot of questions to ask you, but I'm, I'm just looking at some of the questions coming in, and they are such fabulous questions that I, I feel I should um, I should throw it open to the to the floor, so to speak, uh, for the moment at least. Uh, and this is a great question from Judy. Uh, hello, Judy. Uh, you don't say where you're from. Uh, who would win a confrontation between Reacher and the Jackal? <laughs> Okay, gentlemen, fight it out between your sons. All your Lee. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, normally the, the way to get around a question like that is to, it's, if there are two tough guys, you normally say they wouldn't fight each other because they would see that they had so much in common that they would just go for a beer instead. Yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. sure that's the case with the jackal um, mm-hmm. because I think we would have considerable respect for the guy, not only – fear of his skills, but just respect for the professionalism with which he operates. Right. Uh, but Reacher's moral sense would, would mean he would have to defeat him, but that would be a very tough opponent because the whole point of the Day of the Jackal is this guy is um, he's the world's greatest expert, and he absolutely does nearly succeed. As Freddie said, it was a matter of one inch. And again, that's a, about the very similitude of the books. People, I think, ordinary civilians don't realize how long a bullet is in the air uh, when you fire it from a rifle. It's, it can be a second or more. And so there's plenty of time for, for that dip of the head. Um, so, yeah, Risha would be, Risha would find the jackal a very worthy opponent. And, of course, I'm contractually obliged to say Risha would win, but I'm really not sure. <laughs> okay, Freddie, over to you. Well, I, I don't think the, the jackal will be interested unless he was paid. Right. So we would have to have a paymaster who says, I want that big uh, six foot five inch brute uh, who was ex uh, dead. Uh, I know the jackal would need to know why. It would be a question that I want to face. Uh, a, a picture of you know, what else details you can provide. And the thing about it is, I don't think that the the Reacher wouldn't know that he was a, there was an assassin after him. Would he have been informed? If mm. not, he'd be quietly going about his business and suddenly the, a bullet through the brain. So it's mm. pretty nasty stuff. But uh, the Jackal wasn't a face-to-face man. He was no. uh, I mean, uh, 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 a Jackal, uh, you know, is, is, is a, a creature of the night. He comes silently and deviously he kills because it's what he does. He's a predator, and then he's gone by dawn, but you never see his traces. So I think we'll say that Jackal would probably assassinate uh, or Jack Reacher uh, without Jack Reacher knowing why he'd been assassinated. Uh, 
Well, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because although they're both clearly on, on completely the opposite sides of the moral fence, yeah. Jack Richer is a very moral man and, and, and in a way a sort of classical, one might almost say mythical hero, you know, doing, doing, doing endless uh, battles against injustice and, and wrong. Whereas the jackal is the absolute uh, uh, acme of, of evil, so to speak. But they are both uh, consumer professionals. They're both absolutely. Yeah. So that's the similarity between them. They are they are equals in, in in that sense. So it would be a would be maybe the best thing would be if they did go off and have a beer together and uh, and, 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 and talk about it. Right. I know. Yes, you're right. Jack Reacher has, has a, a is, is for if you like for morality, for decency. And uh, he is opposed to injustice. He sees it and he tries to do something about it. Hmm. Uh, so there, there is this moral conscience inside Jack Reacher. It doesn't exist inside this man called the general. No. So if it was a question of uh, you know, who, who does what to who, I think the general would have to be commissioned to it by a paymaster. And I don't think that Jack Reacher would even know that he's being targeted. Uh, and it would be no contest because it would be put in the night. I think what's fascinating about the book, is, depending on what angle that you look at it, is the contest between the Jekyll and Claude Labelle, the, uh, yeah. Yeah. the French police investigator. These are two guys doing a very difficult job as best as they can, uh, radically different personalities, but yeah. fundamentally opposed to each other in a way that is a very equal contest. Yep. Yes. Back then, I was so naive that I thought the decent, um, moderate, uh, moral police officer was the hero. It was the guy that we ought to be rooting for, the guy we ought to think, I like that guy. He's, he's a decent man, married, okay, a house in the, in the suburbs. He's never going to be multi-rich because uh, he doesn't he just lust for, for riches, but he'll do his duty by... by his oath in France, and uh, I'd like him to win. That wasn't what happened. No. <laughs> the, pop, the populace said we like that awful, horrible London, uh, yeah. which brings from with the cold eyes. Uh, he became the hero. Yeah, I have to tell you, I was rooting, from the, rooting for the jackal from the first page. <laughs> <laughs> That's how perverse I am. It's probably um, a reflection on your morality. I'm sure it is. Uh, we've had um, lots of questions about films, film adaptations, and, and uh, both of you have had films made of your books. Uh, how generally have you have you fared with that? Have you been were you happy, Freddie, with with the Day of the Jackal? There were three, four, five, and the best by far, I think, was still the first. It was Jackal yeah. it was by Fred Zinnerman, who was a master master filmmaker. He did, among other things, the, the uh, one of the greatest I think, questions ever. I know. Absolutely. Uh, he did the man for all seasons, which was his project before Jack Hall. Um, and and he, he did a great job on Jack Hall. Um, so I, I would say, yes, that was the best, the best of, the, of, the, of the five. I, I was actually watching the film just recently uh, in preparation for this, and I noticed that that there, there, there are a whole sort of uh, screes from the book, uh, spoken speech from the book, which just they lifted wholesale and put in the film. I mean, it's just basically that there, there, there are portions of, of recorded speech which are, which are just lifted straight from the book. So, yeah, which is, which is a tribute well, to. Zinnerman was was very extraordinary man. I met him many times. Became very friendly with him. Um, a lot of directors, you know, I take a book, but really they they make a dog's breakfast. Of it. They change everything. They think they can change. He made a plan from the outset he was going to follow the story as best he conceivably could. And he asked me to make some short names for him because he only had two hours, 15, whatever, to play with, uh, which is a tough discipline for quite a complicated story. So we worked together on that. Um, he uh, didn't, <laughs> he very much didn't want a towering international screen giant to be the jackal and turned down some, some big, big names. Okay. Uh, and picked um, Edward Fox. Now, Edward had had a good success with Lord Trimmingham in the go between. Got himself, I think, as, uh, uh, an award for it. But it didn't make him a global star. Hmm. That suited Fred Zinnerman perfectly because uh, he wanted a face that could pass into the crowd and disappear. So one day he asked me to his office and he put it in front of me six. Postcard size portraits. 
all British males, all blonde, blue eyed, all handsome young men. Uh, I said, which one for you is the jackal? I looked. I don't know why, I picked the bottom right hand one. Hmm. And I tapped him. He said, I'm so glad I've just cast him. His name's Edward Fox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then he asked me over to the scene with one of the scenes in uh, Paris when they were shooting. And that was when I met Edward. And we became pals. Brilliant. How about you, Lee? Did you, were you given the option to cast Tom Cruise? Or? Well, well, I was given a sort of negative option in as much as um, the, uh, the producers, uh, producers all flew to New York and said they were going to take me out to dinner. And I could tell by the restaurant they chose, which was extremely fancy, expensive and hard to get into, I could tell that they were going to say it, would, it was Tom Cruise. And, and, um, and they did early in the dinner. They said, what do you think about Tom Cruise? And I had about half a second <clears throat> to react. Uh, if I'd thrown myself to the floor screaming, they would have probably cancelled the whole project. Um, but in a half a second, I just I'll thought, dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, uh, you yeah, know, he's, he's the biggest global movie star left and um, it will promote my books and my brand all around the world. So I said, yes. And I've got nothing bad to say about Tom. He's a lovely man, wildly misrepresented in, in, in the media and so yeah. on. He's a good friend and, and we get on very, very well. But the whole point of Risha is that he is um, physically intimidating. Um, and Tom, for all his loveliness, really isn't. And so the films in and of themselves, I thought were expertly made and, and, and very good, but kind of missed the point. So I took it away from feature films and we're now doing streaming television and uh, with, with an actor that is actually Reach's size and oh. looks like Reach's. So oh. I think the second time around is going to be much more palatable to the book readers. Okay, that's interesting. Can you tell us who the actor is? Yeah, the actor is Alan Richson, who is, he's done a few things, but he is um, uh, relatively new, a uh, huge guy, very physical, but also very cerebral. And I was just talking to him yesterday, actually, and found out that he is actually a seriously good chess player. And suddenly it all snapped into focus for me. This is why he's right, because he is a brute but he is smart as well. And um, it's looking great on screen so far. So I really hope that the, the readers are gonna like this one. And, and is he happy for you to call him a brute? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, just don't forget, I'm the only person that Reacher is afraid of. I could make him do anything. I could make <laughs> a whole book wearing ballet tutu. <laughs> and do you get, uh, because you've, 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 uh, you've popped up in the films, haven't you, yourself? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you're an airport security guard. Uh, Ch ch checking uh, someone's passport. Uh, is that written into your contract? You always have to appear in the film. Uh, it, well, sort of unwritten in my contract, yes. Un I, did my, I did my scene yesterday and uh, it was, um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Brilliant. Okay, uh, now Graham, again, Graham hasn't said where he's from, but hello, Graham. How successful would an operator like the Jackal be with today's political and border systems in the UK and Europe? So obviously much much tighter controls now, the whole thing, technolo te technology rules. Freddie, how, how do you think he'd cope with that? Would he be able to move with the ease that he does in the day of the jackal? Well, I've, yeah, you may imagine I've been asked this, and frankly, if modern technology were brought into that era, suddenly he'd be caught, no question about it. Uh, the, the, the French character is um, and they would uh, suddenly be able to, to uh, tag him uh, when he entered France down in the, on the Montemilia border, uh, they would have his car, they would have all sorts of things about him. Um, and uh, even though there might have been uh, a slight glitch thinking he was a man called uh, Charles, uh, 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 Charles Elton, um, but uh, it, it wouldn't have mattered, they'd have got him. Right. But if he were today, the whole thing today, then he too would be up to scratch probably. He too, being a thorough professional, would have mastered cyber technology probably to the nth degree. And he right. would have cyber deceptions to defeat French uh, officials. Uh, 
or whatever it is, rules of law and order. They too have flaws um, and they have um, uh, areas of weakness, which are very, very clever. The scammer can get past, as they do every day. You know, scamming now is probably the most prevalent crime in Britain. Yes. Every day people are robbed, 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 because these scammers are very, very clever. So I think the Jack would, would be very, very clever. And probably clever enough to get past most of them. Yes. This is, this is the new arena for the thriller, isn't it? Really, yeah. uh, cyberspace. Yeah. And you, Freddie, you... comes down to one bullet, um, one sniper position, one target, and they still exist. They have vaporized, you know, so it's a question of whether the force of order could be on the top of the killer before he got there. Would he nowadays? I don't know. I don't know. I think it's very much up in the air still. Hmm. You've, I mean, both of you have written many, many, many books, and, and Lee, you've, you've, you've effectively said that you're, you're retiring from Jack Reacher, and, and your brother has taken over. Um, what, what made you decide to do that? Well, two things really. Number one was that uh, when I started out writing, I, from my experience from other long-running authors, I, I made myself a promise that I would never ever phone it in. I would always give every book 110%. And I'm, I'm proud that I've, I have. All my, I've, every book that I've done is as good as I could possibly make it. But I did feel in my head that it, the day was coming. Um, maybe not next year, maybe not the year after, but sooner or later I would be phoning it in. And that was not acceptable to me. Um, so I felt it was time to get out. And also because Again, thinking back to the, the formative period for Day of the Jackal, you know, the late 60s, uh, the turn of 1970, I was a young person then and really enraged about the way old people stuck around, taking up all the space and sucking up all the oxygen. Why weren't they giving the new generation a chance? And so I feel on a bound now. I, I am the old person who is uh, taking up all the space and sucking up all the oxygen. And so, because of that 50-year-old promise uh, or feeling that I'd had, I feel on a band now I've got, to, I've got to obey it and I've got to fade away and let somebody else take over, give, give somebody else a chance. Well, I have to tell you that Patricia, uh, who's joining us from Ashvale, uh, she's disputing me. She says, Lee, please reconsider calling yourself an old person and rescind your intention to retire. I'm not ready to do without you yet. Well, um, that's, oh, you've, you've, that's very, very nice. You but, just can't go. You know, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Oh, uh, Freddie, I mean, you're you're not ready to retire yet, surely. You're not an old person. Oh, no, no, please, please. Uh, I'm retired. Um, it's the thing about, about Lee. He was immensely prolix. A very prolific writer. He did, I think, 25, was it? 25 years. One per year, and they weren't slim books. They were well with research, well worked out, uh, convoluted, uh, full measure books each year. That's a hell of a workload. Now, I didn't do that. I did about 15 major books in 45 years. That's one per three. Mm. So, working more slowly uh, and taking time off, uh, easier myself. So, uh, I reached 80 and decided that was it. I had enough. I mean, I really had enough. And partly the reason was the research was getting very, very burdensome and very exhausting. Uh, and I was, it led me inevitably to certain hot spots, hell holes, like Guinea-Bissau and uh, um, uh, Mogadishu. Because the last time I went to Mogadishu, I was 75. And my wife said, if you ever do anything stupid like that again, because it's not nice. He said, you know, you're going to have problems with me. That's okay, darling. You know, well, we don't have anything. They, they, they want to tell them what we want to do. So um, I, I thought that she's right, actually. It shouldn't go on uh, going to these uh, god awful places. Uh, I, I don't dodge bullets the way I used to. And, uh, so let's pack it in and you know, sit in Buckinghamshire and play with the Jack Russells and uh, swim in the pool and uh, write a column once a week in a, in a daily newspaper. Why not? Uh, and I got a few parties, and then of course COVID struck. So, like, right, yeah. parties, <laughs> but then yeah. we're coming back. 
But you're not you're not tempted to write a, a, a heartwarming story set in Hampstead or something. You, you you wouldn't like to just completely change track as far as novels are concerned. All the Hampstead heartwarming stores in Hampstead. Uh, I don't know. No, I don't think so. no, not my cup of tea. Not I for you. Those are one thing. It's really what I do best is you know, a bit of dust and a bit of distributive violence. Uh, and, but the research for all this still doesn't. I think. I mean, I can't just sort of paper it over and say, "Well, never mind all this." I got to find out. So right. I'm just trying to research for stories of which a large part, two chapters at least, would have to be set in Mogadishu or Somaliland or Somalia. Uh, I thought, uh, let's look it up. So I looked it up on on, on the web, and uh, it wasn't. No, no, no. This is not it's a big thing. This is not believable. This really isn't. This, it got, I got to go there and see it. I want to see it because it's completely different. It's an odor, a smell, um, about a, a sort of really rather dangerous place like Mogadishu that you don't get through a screen. You don't no. get seen, smelled, uh, experienced. So I went in there the first time I've ever, ever been in some, some area places with a bodyguard. You took a bodyguard with me, ex Special Forces man. Egg. And he had something under his left armpit. I didn't like quite what it was. I think it was mm -hmm. <laughs> He never used it. But it was good to know he was there if need be. And uh, we spent three days beyond the wall compound around the airport, where the whites live, in, um, in, in sort of, if I, if I say anything like Somalia or Mogadishu, uh, where you stand out a bit. You've got a honky face. Uh, yes. And if you know everyone wants to have a go at you, you're not far to find. There you are, dealing away with your wet face. But we, we enjoyed what we enjoyed. We found it interesting to be part of the competition. Then we came back out of the airport, boarded the next flight out, and that was that. That, that I got home and went in and the talking to. But I thought that probably she's probably right. That's about times enough. You know, I'm 80 years old, and uh, I really don't. Do need to do this anymore. Why am I doing it? Answer, well, good question. Why? So no, mm. it's not, settle down. I, I like I like your what, what you just say about the smell of the place. There, 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 there speaks an old foreign uh, foreign reporter. Well, there, your, there, your, yeah, instinct, your instincts there, never your instincts never die in that respect. Every city has its its odor, its characteristics, its uh, smell. Yeah, uh, its nature, which. Doesn't come over easily on a search down at the you know, a, a, a sort of audio you know, tube or a cyber space tube. You've got to go there, smell it, feel it, wander the streets. Is, uh, is, that, is, is that true for you as well, Lee? Because again, your your I mean, your books aren't set in Mogadishu, uh, but uh, Jack Reacher travels backwards and forwards across the states. He's in New Orleans, he's in Washington, and I, I'm presuming that. that you would have made all these journeys. You would have you would have driven those lonely roads, um, checked out those uh, seedy motels and those diners and so forth. Uh, is, 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 is the traveling bug done for you as well, or are you still going to be going down Route 66 in an open top of Mustang? I probably will. I mean, I love that kind of travel where you uh, it's cash in your pocket and a twenty dollar motel and um, you know. In, I was in uh, Eastern Washington State one time and uh, had a steak in a diner that hung off both sides of the plate at once to pour it <laughs> off. Um, you know, I love that that lifestyle, and uh, I do it all the time. I um, I'm the only writer in history who asks to be downgraded in his hotels. You know, when they put you on a book tour and they show you the list of hotels, I say no, I want somewhere cheaper because I I like real life in that sense. But right. Uh, writing is two things, you know, first of all, the experience of it, the thinking about it, the daydreaming, and then comes the business of it, the typing and the promoting and so on. So I will always do the first part. Uh, it's only the second part that I'm skipping now. Right, right. I mean, you travel with your own toothbrush, of course. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I'm <laughs> with me right now. Um, Oh, I've done. Be giving you a, a signal. We've got two minutes actually, uh, and I was going. I'm sorry, we're going to have to wrap it up quite quite quickly because I wanted to talk, Lee. I wanted to talk to you. You, you said something rather wonderful about uh, uh, coming from Birmingham, uh, and somebody's actually raised a question about you coming from Birmingham, and you said you'd always wanted to be a Birmingham artisan. 
you use that phrase an artisan and, and you've also said it's, it's it's the writer it's the job of the writer to do the work and the job of the reader to enjoy the work and that's a very i love that sort of workman like attitude to it and that humble attitude to it and, and that's that's how that's how you've always seen writing as an artisan absolutely i'm deep down i'm a brummy who will uh, i want to make things of, of great value with great skill but i don't want to be all highfalutin about it um right. you know we're not curing cancer we're not saving the world it, it, this is entertainment and i think the author should put in a, a shift and uh, produce a great product and then basically shut up Freddie, you've, I mean, you've brought pleasure to millions of people. Uh, that must be immensely satisfying to you. Sure. Yeah. But, you know, I think, I, I, like Lee, I think this moment is come when um, old codgers should move over. And I mean, I'm an older codger than Lee, but about a right. decade and a half at least. Um, but in my time, certainly has come. Move over, make room. Um, there are a lot of guys trying to, um, you know, write a good book. Like, go ahead, do it, do it, succeed. I'm not in your way. Um, and in any case, uh, I can't do it anymore. I don't think I can do it anymore. I, I, I really suspect that whatever I had, and I think what I'm saying is the impetus is gone. Even if the talent hasn't, the drive has gone. There is no drive left. I don't want to do it anymore. So why force myself, you know? Right. God's good grace, I've got a few pennies for goodbye uh, with Mr. Barclay, and um, I may survive. <laughs> well, you, 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 deserve your, you, deserve your, you deserve your Jack Russell, your swimming pool, and your rest. And, and yep. uh, thank you, thank you for all the pleasure you've given us. And, and you too, Lee, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you both. Yeah, my pleasure, absolutely. It's been one of the joys of my job is meeting my heroes, and I admired Freddie so much, and now uh, we know each other. It's wonderful. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, and I'm sure everyone has enjoyed it. So once again, uh, good evening from, from us here at The Telegraph, from Toronto, uh, from Buckinghamshire. Uh, and I really hope you've enjoyed the conversation.